Well, um, as, as was mentioned, uh, the House is going to vote on, again, a very important piece of legislation. Uh, this is the Department of Defense funding that equips our service members with the resources they need to protect our country and the threats that it faces. Uh, this is not the first time the House has voted on this bill. This is not the second time the House has voted on this bill. This is the third time the House has voted to fund our military. Uh, you heard it from Paul Cook straight. Why is this the third time that the House will have voted to fund our military? Because the Senate Democrats continue to hold that funding hostage. They threaten to filibuster this legislation, which makes it impossible for the Senate to pass and for the President to sign it into law. Senate Democrats are playing politics with defense spending that is so vital to our national security needs. So we just don't see this as, as irresponsible, it's dangerous. You do have training accidents happening more and more these days. We had more people die in training accidents last year than died in combat last year. So these CRs, the reason we're having all of these CRs is because of these filibusters of these vital appropriation bills. So <clears throat> as we saw last week in Paul's district, the consequences are very real. Our men and women in uniform, they depend upon these resources to keep themselves safe and to keep us safe. Um, so I urge uh, the Senate Democrats to do the right thing. Drop the filibuster, process the legislation. Um, we want to find a DACA solution. We will find a DACA solution. So don't hold up our military funding hostage for this. Let's move forward. Um, on a positive note, um, I'm excited to hear President Trump's State of the Union address tonight. And honestly, the State of the Union is looking up. It's really encouraging to be able to uh, come and hear an upbeat tone at a State of the Union. Uh, this will be my 20th of these that I've sat in. And I've got to tell you, uh, to be able to hear a State of the Union as bright as it is right now is something that's very encouraging. Wages are rising. Economic confidence is coming back to America. Tax reform is now the law of the land, and it is playing a huge role in this transformation. As, as Steve just mentioned, just yesterday, we heard from another major employer about investing another $50 billion into this economy because of tax reform. Just a couple of weeks from now, 90% of American workers, 90% of American wage owners, earners are going to see their paychecks get bigger as the IRS new withholding tables are put into effect in February. This is a big deal. Look, Jana and I were working the concession stand at our parish on Sunday uh, for our kids' basketball games, and a friend of mine who works at the Home Depot in Janesville could not wait to come up and tell me about the bonus that he had gotten, about the wage increase that he had gotten, what it's going to do for his life. You know, wherever you go, you have people coming up to you saying, you know, this is a new car payment for me. This is working. And what those of us who've worked on this issue for so many years thought and suspected was, if we do tax reform in America the right way, it will unlock a lot of economic potential. It is unlocking so much more economic potential than we even imagined. So we're very excited. Economic confidence in America is at a 17-year high, while unemployment in America is at a 17-year low. These are good things. This is a big deal for Americans across the country. We've got a lot more work to do, and I'm looking forward to the President Trump's speech tonight to find the way forward uh, and get, get more done for the American people in 2018. Questions? Manu. Mr. Speaker, regarding the Nunez memo, uh, why is it okay for the Republicans in the House to release a Republican memo and not at the same time as a Democratic memo to give the American public a full picture, or at least both sides of the argument underlying this underlying? Manu, what's okay is to follow the process as the process is laid out, and that's precisely what is happening. I would main, mind, remind you that the Democrats tried blocking the rest of the members of Congress from even having access to the memo that the majority wrote. Yesterday, the majority voted to provide access to the Democrats' memo. The process is this. It's an 11G process. You've all probably reported on it, which is a memo gets released to the broader members. They read it. Then you go and scrub to make sure that no sources and methods are being compromised, and then you go through the process of releasing it. The, the majority's memo already went through that process. That process is underway. This memo that we just got popped on us yesterday is now going through that process. And I would just tell you, unlike the Democrats on the Intelligence Committee who voted to deny access to this memo to the broader members, Republicans supported doing so. Devin and so now, yeah, Devin actually made the motion. So now it will go through that 11G process just like this other memo did. Why and let me, just say, let me just say a few things. What's that? Yeah, as Kevin was mentioning, um, the chairman went to the FBI to, to, to go through the memo to make sure that we were protecting any sources and methods, and we are confident that we are. None of that work has been done on this new memo that no one has yet read, but the Republicans voted to allow the rest of the members to read it so that it can go through that process. Well, why not hold back? It's, you've, had, you've asked enough. Why not ask the Republicans to wait and release their memo at the same time 
time as Democrats are weak. There's to, to, to try Look, to try to we're going to go through the process as the process is laid out, and, and it's ironic that the majority voted to actually give access to this memos while the minority voted to deny that access. So I think the irony is a little, little, little rich here these days. Casey. Let me make yeah. Let me make four points here. I think there are, you know, as we think about all of this, I actually wrote some of this down. First, there are legitimate questions about whether an American civil liberties were violated by the FISA process. We are the legislative branch of government. It is our job to conduct oversight on behalf of the American people of the executive branch in case any powers were abused and civil liberties were abused by the executive branch. So there's a very legitimate issue here as to whether or not an American civil liberties were violated in the, in the FISA process. That's point number one. Point number two, this is a completely separate matter from Bob Mueller's investigation. And his investigation should be allowed to take its course. Point number three, there may have been malfeasance by people at the FBI. And let me just, let me finish my points. There may have been malfeasance at the FBI by certain individuals. So it is our job in conducting transparent oversight of the, of the executive branch to get to the bottom of that. Sunshine is the best disinfectant. And so we, what we want is all of this information to come out so that transparency can reign supreme and accountability can occur. There's a fourth point I want to make, and that is the institution of the GO, DOJ, of the FBI, is a very important institution for American life. It's a very important institution for keeping the rule of law intact. The men and women, the vast number of the men and women over at DOJ, over at FBI, are professionals doing their jobs and doing their jobs well. The people over in the, in the field office in Milwaukee, at the FBI office, are helping keeping heroin and opioids out of our schools. So we want the people of the FBI to know that we respect their job, we respect who they are and what they do, and all the more reason why we need to have transparency and accountability to hold people accountable if they violated the rules, if they uh, acted I in a wrong, improper way. And that is what we are doing here. Say, Nancy. All the other conclusions uh, that are being drawn by this investigation in the House are being held until the end. Why is it important to get this conclusion? It would have been great to have all the documents that we requested months ago, but we did not. So as you know, the Congress has been asking for all of these documents from the executive branch so that we can do the executive branch oversight. It's the inspector general who just told us a couple of days ago they all of a sudden found the 5,000 text messages that were lost. So it would be nice if all of this information that Congress had requested would have been delivered when we asked for this stuff last August. So we had not been getting the information until fairly recently. That is why this is taking so long. Last I think Rod Rosenstein is doing a fine job. I have no reason to see why he should do that. Uh, R Rod uh, Rosenstein was was hired after this last election. Uh, I think the people at the FBI, at the DOJ, need to clean their own house if there are problems in their own house, and, and I think that's really important. And just he came in after this last election. Are we going to see action on the bills that would prevent the president from firing the special counsel? A very sad day, I think, uh, in the history of this committee. As I said to my committee colleagues during this hearing, sadly, we can fully expect that the President of the United States will not put the national interest uh, over his own personal interest. But it is a sad day indeed when that is also true of our own committee, because today this committee voted to put the President's personal interest, perhaps their own political interest, above the national interest uh, in denying themselves even the ability to hear from the department and the FBI. Um, and that is, I think, a deeply regrettable state of affairs. But it does show how, in my view, when you have a deeply flawed person in the Oval Office, that flaw can infect the whole of government. And it ta today, uh, tragically, it infected our committee. Uh, and at this point, uh, I'll yield to my colleagues. Well, I just, we're not talking about the invest, we're not talking about the investigation. We're talking about the distraction that they have created. And that's sad and unfortunate because uh, if you're a Democrat or Republican, you should care just as much about this. They attacked the democratic process. They hacked into boards of election. And one could imagine a scenario in which they were just as likely to attack 
a republican candidate as a democrat.